evening. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here with us this evening. Uh, my name is Joy Johnson. I'm the president and vice chancellor of Simon Fraser University. And I want to begin today's event in a good way. And I can think of no better than to invite um, Elder Margaret, uh, a member of SFU's elders program and our good friend to offer a traditional welcome um, for this evening. Elder Margaret, over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to do your opening this evening. And congratulations to the president. I haven't seen you for a year. Doing a good job. Just a very quick prayer for each and every one of you. Great spirit, thank you for bringing us together. Just guide each and every one of us on the path that we're on. Thanking the communities from where we come from and our families for allowing us to do the work that we do. I ask Great Spirit just a very special blessing on each and every one's family, especially the young children who are going through difficult times. And I ask Great Spirit just a very special blessing on the pathway of our president on my relations. Thank you. Well, thank you ever so much, Elder Margaret. It's so great to see you. And I wanna thank you for that wonderful welcome. I wanna recognize that uh, I am privileged to be speaking to all of you today from the traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, at this president's faculty lecture with Dr. Herendosa, who's gonna address us shortly on the topic of envisioning social justice from the margins. As many of you know, the president's faculty lectures are part of SFU Public Square, and this is a signature initiative of our vision as Canada's engaged university. By providing you opportunities to hear from and engage with leading researchers and scholars, these lectures are designed to enlighten and promote dialogue on important issues of public interest. This year, uh, this series of six lectures is exploring the theme of resilience and recovery from a variety of disciplines. I, I can't think of a better topic. It's certainly fitting for our times and a great way for us to share ideas and to connect with one another. That's why we're using Zoom meeting um, format today. I think it really provides an opportunity for more connection. We can see each other in this webinar format. It allows us to see each other through the videos and to communicate through the chat box. And I encourage you to do that. I want to begin by encouraging you to feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat right now. Um, let us know uh, who you are and where you're joining from. Uh, it would be great to see, uh, see those connections. Uh, there's going to be a chance um, this evening to raise questions and offer comments after the lecture. And so I'm going to really be encouraging you to do that. Think about your questions as you're listening to the lecture. You can type them in the chat as we go along at any point during the lecture. And I'll be keeping an eye on them and I'll either post them, but also call on um, the audience and you can also pose them um, during the Q&A portion of the event. Uh, I want you to note that we do have closed captioning available and you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen if you do require closed captioning. I want you to also note that this lecture is being recorded and it's gonna be available if you want to uh, let a friend know about the lecture, if you'd like to see it again, it's gonna be available on the SFU Public Square website and YouTube channel. Um, I, it, I think it's also important to remind you of uh, the way we do engage together about our community guidelines. Uh, and they're gonna be posted uh, on the slide as well as in, uh, and also I think in the chat box, so you can check them out. Uh, we want to have good discussion and dialogue, um, but I, I think it goes without saying that there's really no tolerance for any promotion of discrimination or harm towards others. We want a respectful and very, very engaged discussion. So uh, it's such, uh, so, such a great pleasure to be introducing Perendosa this evening. Dr. Perendosa is a professor of anthropology and associate member in the Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies at SFU. Her teaching and research interests include migration and diaspora, gender, health, and social palliation, ethnographic methods, and structural violence in war and peace. 
Her work on Muslim women in the homelands and diaspora has been published in edited collections and scholarly journals. We're excited um, to have her here with us to talk about envisioning social justice from the margins. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dosa. Professor Dosa, over to you. Dr. Johnson, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about a subject that is dear to my heart. I also want to express uh, my appreciation to the support staff for all the work that they have uh, put in. And um, Elder Margaret, uh, your prayers were very inspiring. Welcome all. So to be, uh, I want to actually um, post my slides. I'm going to do that now. Okay, so. Okay, it's working fine. <laughs> so to begin with, I want to state that my take on social justice is that of collaboration with individuals, with communities, and with stakeholders. I want, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that SFU is on unceded coast Salish territories of the Musquam, Squamish, Saleswatut and Kwakwetlam First Nations. I also want to acknowledge the contribution of my research participants to my project. So Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So my task in terms of introducing my subject was made easier by First Nations protesters whom I came across during my regular walks on the trail close to Trans Mountain Pipeline. A pipeline that is being constructed on unceded territory. There were eight protesters, as you can see from this image, and there were four police cars and four policemen. The date was November 30th, 2020. Facing the policeman, one indigenous protester conveyed the following message. We come to you with drums and songs. You have guns in your safety belt. You can harm us. We do not mean any harm. We invite you and your children to walk with us on this land that you have stolen from us. Drums and songs actually evoke critical questions. This is because they are embedded in musicality, rhythms, and lyrics. And the, this mode of uh, conveying messages raises two questions. Two questions. One is how is human beings continue to exist in the midst of social justice? And what are the forces that compromise our humanity? I would now like to turn to a second image. This is from my work on politics and poetics of migration. The image is that of an uprooted tree. It is a metaphor for multi-layered displacement, a form of displacement that has to be addressed again for the project on social justice that I will talk about at length in a moment. But essentially, this particular tree speaks 
to the necessity of replanting it in a soil that can nourish it and allow it to bear fruit for humankind as a whole. This is a small step towards achieving social justice. But I do not think that small steps should be dismissed lightly. I want to cite uh, one particular phrase from my mother tongue of Gujarati, tipe tipe sarovar barai, which means that a stream is filled by drops of water. So bef before I continue, I want to now um, actually um, talk about uh, how we can envision social justice from the margins of society. First of all, people who are on the margins, they embody lived, re lived realities of social oppression and racism, violence of racism. Their understanding points to alternative ways of being and becoming. And they chalk pathways that blur boundaries between the East and the West, reason and emotion, material and spiritual worlds. It is also important to note that people on the margins deploy multiple pedagogies like storytelling, memories, language of the body, language of silence, the analytic of everyday life. And it is through these multiple pedagogies that they invite participants to engage with them in ongoing dialogue and conversations. Because I do not think that the project on social justice can have a closure because our life is dynamic and there are issues and contexts that emerge on a continual basis. So in terms of illustration, I would like to uh, quickly go through four stories from my book on uh, racialized bodies and disabling worlds. But before I do that, I want to talk very briefly about the power of stories, because what I'm going to relate to you are actually stories. So what kind of role do stories play in our lives? Stories, first of all, bring to light the fragility and vulnerability of life for all human beings. The, the worlds and worlds of the participants are captured poignantly by stories, but stories also point to the fault lines of the system, the gaps, and also the way in which these gaps and these fault lines are addressed by people on marginal um, spaces. Uh, what um, the metaphor that I think would serve uh, to sum up what I have said is that of the tapestry. Now the tapestry has single threads and each thread represents a singular story. If all the threads come together, they lead to the constitution of the whole. So now um, let me just go through um, the four stories that I referred to earlier. The first story that um, I am going to share with you is that of Merun. Um, Merun is a differently able-bodied person who came from Uganda during the time of the Asian exodus in 1971. When I first talked to her, she introduced herself as a woman with disability. The, the, uh, this is the phrase that she used. She did not say that 
I have polio. Having said, if she had actually used the second phrase, I have polio, it would have meant that disability identity comes first and her personhood is secondary to um, her condition of having polio. Now, Merun had um, a very difficult time settling down in, in Canada, which is the place where she came directly from Uganda. Uh, this is because at the time of her migration in 1970s, um, there was, she was subject to a structural exclusion, racism, uh, and uh, also um, not, rec not a lack of recognition concerning her personhood. So Merun um, decided to um, study further. She was educated fluent in English and she to be registered at um, the University of British Columbia and became a social worker. But somehow or the other, she was not employed. And essentially uh, she said that she was treated more like a client rather than an employee. So having experienced this form of social injustice, she decided to do advocacy work. 70s and 80s was also the time when community integration movement and individual living movements were gaining ground. So Merun decided to go to institutions, identify people um, who were differently abled and encourage them to move into the community. She stated that doing so, there would be a mass of differently abled people in the community whereby their stories would be heard. So I am just, uh, just going to read a passage from her work. Um, this is because um, the discipline that I belong to, we take uh, exercise caution that we do not appropriate um, the stories of people uh, who are generous uh, to share these with us. So this is what Merun says, and we would get a greater impact if I were to cite this. She says, at the hospital, there are people who have been living there for 30 years. It is not easy. I cannot quite see, there's not enough light. Can, we, can I have some light? Uh, it is not easy for them to move into the community, especially when a full support system is not in place. In my work, I find out what kind of services are there for them. I go to the hospital and talk to the people and try and convince them that they should give a try to live in the community. You see, these people have a lot of fear. They have been protected and they don't know where to start. I find uh, this, uh, her work uh, is being very important because what she is doing is she is engaging into social justice work, uh, which I think that is often rendered socially invisible. Because the stories of people who are on the margins of society are not easily heard. They are buried and so, this is an example of how she herself experiences social injustice. And then she goes out and actually chalks a pathway for, for work that we would consider as part of social justice, even if this is on a small scale. The second story that I like to cite is that of Tamiza. She came from Tanzania and she is raising two children who are differently able, and she refers to her children as special needs children. And she says that I do not hide my children. In other words, she informed me that when she has to take time off from work, she doesn't tell her boss that she needs a, a sick a leave. Um, she spells out that I am going to take leave because I need to take care of my children. 
So in other words, if she had taken uh, leave, she, it would have been paid. But taking time off for her children meant that it was unpaid uh, a leave. And I'm also going to kind of cite very quickly a, sh a short passage. You know, I do not hide my children. When people ask me, I tell them that they are special needs children. If they do not understand, it is their problem, not my problem. I tell Faisal that he should use Islamic words of Alhamdulillah, everything is due to Allah and SubhanAllah. I am grateful to Allah all the time. His workers, that is caregivers, ask, what does this mean? And this way, they learn more about Islam. I found it very interesting and also very, um, I think it's very profound to note that within the space uh, of um, an institution or a group home where her children reside, uh, Tamiza's children are engaged in actually interrogating the commonplace narrative of Islam as being the other. So that I just thought was really also another example of social justice work. Uh, my third example comes from Firuze. Uh, she identified herself as, a, uh, as actually as a wheelchair user, not a wheelchair bound. And one day her wheelchair broke and she phoned her uh, service worker and she was told that they are on vacation uh, and that her chair, her wheelchair was not repaired for two weeks. She uses, Firuze uses this incident to actually interrogate the script that people who are disabled do not contribute to society. She said, while my wheelchair was being under repair, I just sat on the sofa and it prevented me from doing work that um, I would um, usually do, that is cook, clean, uh, take care of my family. She has three children and a husband and also attend uh, English as second language uh, classes. And so just a little, um, you know, just a kind of short um, passage from here. Firuze brings home the impact of her two week confinement through body language, sitting on the sofa and narrative subversion of the script, disability equals dependence. So I will now uh, continue and move on. And um, what uh, I would like to do is introduce you to an Arabic term called suffer. Suffer means journey. And I am motivated to actually um, travel for alternative knowledge on social justice, which I call transborder knowledge, because I do not think that social justice could be actually addressed fully through the confines of the nation state, the uni unit of the nation state. Um, this is because uh, nation states are not able to address social justice in a manner that would bring about structural change. And I say this because um, of the example that we have concerning COVID-19. Now we know that we are all kind of addressing or, or experiencing uh, the impact of COVID-19. It's a global epidemic and yet our responses are national from, from the unit of the nation states. And we should, if we had a global response, I am just wondering how different things would have been to start with, not so many people would have died. And the same uh, scenario applies to climate change. It's, it's, it's a global issue, yet we address this issue within the unit of the nation state. Now my motivation, I, my, I went to Afghanistan in the fall of 2008 and 2009. And my motivation to go to Afghanistan was um, because my daughter was there. And also uh, I wanted to correct in my, you know, within, in, in a modest way, within my discipline of anthropology, um, the, 
the, the misperception that conflict and violence uh, in Afghanistan is caused by the brutality of the Taliban. Taliban. What the world has forgotten is that in 1979, so the former Soviet Union uh, invaded Af Afghanistan. This was the time when the Cold War was at its height. And so United States followed um, right away and um, fought a proxy war by arm arming anti-communist factions, a couple of factions. In 1979, uh, uh, Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, stayed there for about a decade, and left in 1989. So what I want to read here is a passage um, concerning my uh, trip to uh, Afghanistan, my very first observations. It was, it was on the first day of 28 August 2008 when my plane descended into Kabul. As we searched the ground, the majestic mountains gave way to the sight of my myriad mil military helicopters stationed at the airport. There were two main kinds, US NATO um, choppers equipped with latest technology and the older battle-worn remnants from the time of the Soviet occupation, 1978 to 1989. The helicopters served as a tangible reminder of the long-term and continuing violence that has plagued the people of Afghanistan. As I drove along the city streets accompanied by an armed guard, I observed military convoys speeding by while the rest of the traffic came to a halt. There, the foreign troops had the right of way as I found was the case with many things in, in, in the country. I wrote in my diary, this country is at war, but with whom? Surely over 100,000 US NATO troops would not have been deployed to fight the Taliban, these uh, insurgents. Now, so if the world has um, entered into political amnesia, um, the women of Afghanistan remember, and they highlight violence that has entered into the inner recesses of their lives. So briefly, I will just visit the story of one woman, uh, Hamida. Um, she was, she left, for, she and her family left for Iran, and then they were repatriated in 2001. And when she came back, uh, their house was burnt, and they ended up living in a dingy place with one bedroom. Um, so in these circumstances, her three children were traumatized. Her elder son left home. Her second son actually sniffs uh, gasoline from a scarf. And her third uh, daughter, uh, she says, is experiencing mental health issues. So based on this narrative, what Hamida says is that day comes, night comes, but for me, it is always night. So essentially, she is conveying the message that this is the kind of injustice that we are plunged into owing to the superpowers intervention into Afghanistan, yet, um, and you know, as an, as an anthropologist, as an ethnographer, I went into the homes of the women and met them a couple of times. And so yet I observed that she would get up early in the morning, say her, her salat, that is prayers, uh, with, and washing herself with cold water, would you, uh, since hot water was not available. She cooked uh, for her children, her husband, and then she and her husband uh, went to work. They were totally exploited by the school director. And um, when she came back, uh, she would prepare uh, dinner and um, take care of uh, family matters. 
So this is, this is also an example of resilience, of survival. And this is what I learned from the women, that despite uh, social justice having entered into the inner recesses of their lives, they also portrayed themselves as competent mothers, competent wives, competent daughters. So in, I just want to read one more passage from this book. And um, that is, if these women have taken the initiative to witness and remember their own stories, what then is our responsibility as researchers and readers? We cannot overemphasize the point that we ourselves may not have endured suffering. We study it. This is the reason why we need to witness and remember with them, not for them, a position that can lead to appropriation of their stories of suffering. But there was another script that came to light when I was in Afghanistan. And the script is that Afghanistan and Canada are related. And here by Canada, what I mean is superpowers. Uh, and so he, I'm going to show you some slides to illustrate this point. So what we have here is uh, Afghanistan and this is Canada. So there are two countries side by side, but they are com com considered to be far apart uh, in terms of economics, in terms of politics uh, and socially and culturally. So let us continue. So here um, in the first picture, we have uh, the militarization of scenic Afghanistan. So you can see there is a US soldier there. And these are our scenic Canadian Rockies. Now, I was thinking that if there was no militarization in Afghanistan, one of the poorest countries in the world that has, still has military occupation after 18 years since the invasion of this country, in 2001, they would also have had tourists. It's a beautiful scenic country. So this is an area where we can uh, actually connect and relate. Um, this is, um, you know, here we have, we are having chai with the Afghan family. And I found it very, very interesting that despite the fact that they did not have a lot to share because of violence and war, they still had a spread uh, for us. Uh, and so instead of having you know, um, nuts and cashew nuts and almonds um, and other kinds of nuts, um, they would put chickpeas, but at least there was a serving. Uh, instead of a variety of vegetables, they had apples and bananas, whatever they could get. And this was, this was very touching scene. Uh, this is an extended family. And um, I also did some research on Afghan women uh, in Metropolis, Vancouver. And so I really like this particular picture of uh, the woman in the left. Uh, she says, I have a story to tell. And when I look at her picture and I look at her wrinkles, I think every wrinkle has a story to tell. And on the right, there is this Afghan woman uh, who now lives in Canada, but she had to go through what is referred to as the immigrant struggle, you know, um, not being able to secure uh, full citizenship rights uh, because of racialization. So now we move on, you know, we are trying to establish connections between um, Afghanistan and Canada, and Canada would also is also stands for, you know, other parts of the world as well. So here we have an armed guard, and there is barbed wire. And if there is an attack, now the armed guard is actually taking care of and protecting expatriates who live in this compound, and. Um, uh, if there is an attack, he is the first one to be killed. But on the right hand side, what I have are gated commune, gated home, gated communities. We may want to give some, if we are, want to advance the project on social justice, we may want to give some thought as to 
the way in which we have adopted uh, gated communities as the norm. So we keep out other people uh, out of fear uh, and it prevents us from actually creating an enabling environment, an environment where social interactions take place and that um, where we do not other um, people whom we don't know. So here, uh, what I have is an enactment of violence. You will see many scenes like this uh, if you were to go to Afghanistan. Uh, and then, so this is injustice, but then there is also peace. Now here you see, um, you know, girls, and mostly it is the mothers who insist that their daughters go to school because they often tell me again and again that we don't want to experience what, uh, you know, we don't want our children to experience what we are experiencing. So here again, it shows that, you know, injustice and justice are intertwined from the point of view of the, of the way in which marginalized people suggest pathways for justice. So before I continue, I just want to read a passage here that I wrote. Uh, here we have an example of how knowledge on social justice is generated from struggles and aspirations of people on margins of society. Not to take any action is not an option. This understanding compels us to be ethically and politically present. It requires us to observe, to listen, and learn from their actions and words, compelling us to think from a different place. Jalaluddin Rumi, a Persian poet, said the following, speak a new language and the world will be a new one. Okay, so my next stop then was India. Now, I went to Porbandar, Gujarat, and this is because the Gujarati uh, is my mother tongue, and Gujarat is the homeland, uh, homeland of my ancestors. I wanted to do some research here because uh, of my um, understanding that the Muslim community has been disenfranchised. And one cannot overlook the colonial legacy uh, because when the British ruled India from 1858 to 1947, um, they actually uh, favored the Hindu community uh, and the, the disenfranchisement Muslim of Muslim community began at that time. When um, India got independence in 1947, um, the disenfranchised status of Muslim community did not change, although it's a minority community. It's only 10% of the population. In Porbandar, where I did my research, there are about 300,000 people, out of which 10% are Muslims. So um, what we see here are two pictures. So you see here is a kitchen, but if you look at the background, you can see that it's in need of repairs. Uh, it's the same here, this is the street, and it has just been left um, you know, as is for generations. Um, this is an example of uh, disenfranchisement. Um, but yet in this environment, uh, the Muslim uh, women, uh, in fact, um, sustain uh, their everyday lives. And I wanted to kind of gain an understanding of, of how, how they do that. And so, um, you know, I did some research here. And uh, what I found was, first of all, the houses behind this dump are the uh, places where Muslims reside. And so there is kind of just garbage thrown outside their homes. And the women told, told me or informed me that the children get diarrhea and dysentery and they fall sick. 
uh, but uh, there is not much that um, they can do. Um, they have be, been deprived of citizenship rights in terms of livelihood, in terms of education, in terms of health sector, and in terms of religion. And here we have uh, an elderly woman. I, I call her Zera Bai, Bai out of respect, and she's making lunch. And when I talked to Zera Bai, she said that, you know, if she has to prepare lunch, she has to start early in the morning because somebody has to go and fill these pots of water. There's hardly any water, hardly any electricity. And so all this work is being put in because of the fact that they have to fend for themselves. Um, and yet they survive from day to day. And one reason why they survive is because of um, interconnectivity, because of cultivation of uh, social networks. Now here we have a masjid and mandir. Um, this is the temple and the mosque. And, I, and these are from Porbandar. I took these pictures. And I just thought that how different the world would be if they were to engage met metaphorically right now into a conversation. If the temple, there are lots of temples, there are lots of mosques, because you know, Porbandar has a history like in uh, the rest of India. And how different the world would be if they engaged into conversation and see how they can learn from each other's repertoire of traditions, of knowledge, of wisdom. So I found that you know, the way in which uh, Muslim women survive is coming together. Here are um, four women who are weaving uh, fishing nets because poor Bandar actually uh, is a port. And so they do piecemeal work. And we all know that piecemeal work uh, actually um, brings about very little money, but yet um, it is their daily intake of a budget that would allow them to have needs. So another scenario that I came across over and over again is how women were learning how to do embroidery or sewing, because this is what was available to them. You know? And you can see in the background, again, these places are in need of repair. So it tells a story of its own. So here, um, embroidery, but on the right-hand side, I found it very interesting. What some women do to survive is they would purchase a huge bag of chips, huge bag of rice, huge bag, bag of ch even charcoal. Then they would divide it into small packages for sale. And this way they would get not a large amount of money, a little bit of money that would allow them to purchase their everyday meals. Okay, so this one is a young female vendor. And this is her father and he invited me to take the picture. And um, he essentially said that, you know, we, she, my daughter just stays here from morning to evening and whatever little money that we make is, um, is what we have. Uh, so, you know, uh, in terms of how we survive and um, we kind of continue with our lives. But then in Gujarati, uh, one woman told me that this is our lato, this is my lato, this is our lato, lato means this is my place, because this is where we have grown up, this is where our ancestors have lived. And she, says, uh, she said in Gujarati, that our lato is our place, because what they're saying is that, okay, we will continue to stay here. We don't have anywhere to go, but we are worried about our children. What will happen to them? And so that's, she left me with a question mark. I, I, she didn't have any um, suggestions and uh, except for women to work together. Now here we have a picture in the second one of that of a woman uh, who is uh, differently abled. Uh, she cannot uh, go out and on. Uh, and she comes out every morning with her pot. And whoever can, whatever they can afford, they would put it into her pot and this would be her meal. 
I would not call her a pen handler. I would not call her, uh, you know, being out on the streets because she has very good ties with um, her uh, neighbors. They interact, they chat, uh, you know, and she also engaged into a conversation with me and she said, you know, um, this is the best way that she be, that she survives, and people are helpful to the extent that they can. Now, um, I, when I was in India, there was Diwali celebration. Diwali is the festival of light, and these are electric goods, and they are heading for uh, well-to-do Hindu families. So these are, you know, all electric goods, and you can see that. These are, you know, actually Diva, you know, lights. And so I wanted to actually bring to light the discrepancy between um, the two groups. I was invited to Garba in Ras, it's very common and very enjoyable. But what I discovered that while Muslim women were actually doing embroidery and making homemade clothes, which were uh, really not desirable, these are uh, the, um, dresses and the attires that, uh, you know, affluent Hindu women uh, can afford. And they are from, in, mostly, most of them are from China. And they just, for them, the important thing is to dress well and enjoy themselves. So um, that is uh, what I discovered uh, when I was in India. Then my next and the last uh, actually trip was to Africa. You know, because I was born in Uganda and uh, I wanted to visit Kenya. Uganda would be out of the question because we were rendered refugees in 1971 uh, when Idi Amin asked us to leave the country in 90 days, uh, having we, uh, uh, we have had lived there for three generations. So I wanted to go to Kenya actually to just discover what home would be like if we were not evicted from Uganda. And home is not necessarily a physical place. It can be imagined, it can be narrativized. But my starting point, of course, is the, the scramble for Africa. Uh, and when I look at this particular map, and when I show it to my students, you know, we are all amazed you know, together, that how this particular country, rich in resources, a place, uh, you know, uh, where, um, you know, markets uh, could, could be are lucrative, land, uh, availability of labor, and how this country was divided into nation states um, for the benefit of Western powers. This is what happened the Berlin Conference in 1881. This is what happened. And so uh, different, uh, you know, Western, power, Western powers just moved in and kind of carved it out like you would uh, carve out uh, a, a cake, you know? So, um, but anyway, um, what I discovered, you know, was a paradox. And I will talk a little bit about it. This is my last, last uh, section, so I hope I can cover it. Um, so these, uh, the paradox I discovered was, first of all, again, the legacy of British colonization. Kenya and Uganda were colonized by the British. And the way in which colonization occurred was that the Europeans were on the top, the Asians were in the middle sector, a vulnerable position. I believe that's why we were uh, thrown out. And the Africans, in the lower echelons. Um, and after independence um, in Kenya, uh, which was uh, in some in, uh, sometime in the 19, it, it was actually in 1963, the British were in Kenya from 1920 to 1963. Um, the situation of the Africans had not changed at all. And uh, what I found that they, they were about, there were about 2 million um, African maids uh, or domestic workers uh, in Kenya, the population of 50 million. And I um, did my field work in high ridge flats, uh, parklands, Nagara flats where, uh, you know, Asians lived. And 
this, this is a cloth line and these clothes are washed by African domestic workers. This is an everyday chore, every single day. They wash the clothes and in the evening when they are dry, it's a tropical country, um, they iron them and do a host of, host of work. But um, what I actually, um, I'll come to this in a minute. I just come finish talking about the paradox. So what ex ex actually happened um, was that because of the Asian exodus from Uganda, because of the policy of Africanization, uh, the rise of global capitalism, uh, the Asians aspired to send their children abroad. And the younger Asians also moved abroad. But in some cases, not all cases, the elderly were left behind. And they were taken care of by African uh, who were formerly maids. Now they became care caregivers. Uh, you know, they engaged into elder care. And when um, when this happened, uh, and I said not in all cases, they served these Asian elderly with loyalty, with warmth, and what is referred to as fictive kinship. Murdo refers to this as practical kinship, you know, for practical reasons. But it was beyond that, they were emotional ties. And these elderly people also felt very isolated because they were also cut off from their families. Families went abroad, although they came to visit, but it was not the same thing. So I want to give you an example from Sarah Lem's work. She said that when the elders were in East Africa, not in East Africa, but wherever they were with their families, they would be served with one cup of tea. But if the, el the elderly people went abroad, they were told that your children are busy. You cannot expect to be served with a cup of tea, but you can have 10 cups of tea, but you have to make them yourself. And so, uh, you know, I refer to this as a paradox because even the elderly people who were left behind were not quite happy. They were isolated and lonely, although they had a network of uh, relationships, which is, you know, of course, uh, possible uh, in a country like Kenya. Um, so the paradox is that either the elder person died or he or she went abroad and joined his or her family. This way, the ties that had been developed between African um, workers, care workers, and the um, elderly was ruptured. And so this is a paradox, because here are two uh, you know, groups, both come together because they are both subject to suffering of different kinds, and yet, then they break apart. Uh, I will later let you know how this paradox can be addressed, but I want to move on. And this is, I'm going to go through this very quickly now. Um, this is the Maasai market. And, uh, you know, once a week, the Maasai, they come from far, they bring their, you know, arts and uh, crafts and, you know, Maasai um, clothing. And they sell uh, these goods to tourists. But above them, this is the Diamond Plaza. Above them are all these shops uh, and they are owned mostly uh, by Asians. So again, I see this discrepancy, which I uh, have not been able to resolve because the question I'm asking is how do we address this discrepancy? And I know that there is international labor law, there are international organizations, but uh, they have to work through nation states. They themselves cannot act independently. So here, um, you know, th these are these two women, they came to me and they said, oh, you must take my picture. And, you know, Rafiki means friendship. And they came and told me 
oh vive na toka na na toka gap, na gapi uh, they would say where is your home jumba yako iko wapi but jumba yako iko hapa so they would just after you know having exchanged gre gre greetings like uh, Jambo and uh, you know Mazuri Yako and Abarish Abarisha Sana, and they said, "Oh, but you should be here. Why? Why are you in Canada?" And so, I just thought that this, this is warmth and hospitality that I did um, uh, come across and experience in Kenya, um, but maybe because I was a tourist, that could be the reason. But these are women again earning their livelihood. I never saw, I, there was always African women or sometimes African men who would be sold, selling this produce. And I don't want to call them street vendors. I call them entrepreneurs because that's what they are. And they go through a very difficult time, you know, going to the farm far away and getting this produce. So how do I resolve uh, this particular paradox? And also the question, that my participants in India posed uh, in terms of resolving the situation. So COVID-19 actually kept us home, you know, and we started looking at uh, scholarly uh, literature in, um, we started looking at scholarly literature on, uh, uh, on Islam. And this is the time I came across um, a letter it was written by uh, Imam Ali Abu Talib uh, to Malik al who was the governor of Egypt. I was just kind of, uh, I, this letter just resonated with the question that I was asking. And so it is that, you know, the letter states to the governor that you, first of all, identify people who are on the margins of society and they were not lumped into one group. They were actually named and that you recognize that this constituency is in need of justice from you more than any other among your subjects. Sit with them in a public assembly with all due hum humility before God. And this setting will give them the opportunity to speak in an uninhibited manner, free from the intervention of officers. So the only question I'm asking is that 1,400 years have passed and since this letter was written, and we are still struggling with how to institute uh, social justice. I don't think I'm going to continue. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sacred, but maybe they can come up in the, um, they can come up in the Q and A uh, session. And this last one, this is the vision quest on the trail that I visited. This is a watch house. And, and First Nations people, they go into this watch, watch, house, watch house, engage into vision, uh, vision quest, and they get in touch with the sacred, the spirit of their ancestors. But um, this is it. I think I'm going to stop because I'm, I, I think I have, uh, I need to leave some time. Thank you ever so much, um, Karen, um, Professor Dosa for this, um, wonderful um, lecture in which you took us on many journeys and told many stories. Um, the stories of Maroon, of Tamisa, of Farusa, of Hamida, very moving. And um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions, but I wanna start by asking you a couple of questions if that's okay. Um, let me first by um, um, ask you a, a, a little bit about um, about social justice, and 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 you know advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion is a priority for us at SFU. And I and just want to I'm wondering about how your learnings and and the the findings from your research can help inform our institutions, uh, uh, particularly um, academic institutions. Uh, to think about alternative strategies um, to address um, matters of justice. justice. Um, how can traditions at the margins that you spoke of really help to inform um, our own thinking within the university? Right. I, I commend SFU for the initiative that has been taken. I think it's a very important and you know, necessary step. Uh, my response would be what I tell my students. 
I tell my students that if you want to engage into justice work, the first thing you need to do is first look at your own traditions, the repertoire of knowledge and wisdom that's embedded in your traditions and bring this forward uh, so that we do not just end up just uh, circling around normative discourses, normative acts of practices without kind of shifting the boundaries. So we need to kind of expand our boundaries and include the traditions of racialized minorities who I think have a lot to offer. And this is uh, the spirit in which I shared uh, Imam Ali's letter to his governor, not that I want to be parochial and say this is the only source that we can tap into for insights on social justice. Uh, in my book on social palliation, uh, I make an argument for deep level conversations where traditions and, sac and sacred um, repertoire um, and sacred uh, understanding of our traditions would play a very important role and would complement the work that is done in academic institutions. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I do want to let those who are listening this evening uh, encourage you to put a question in the chat. I'll also check out the participant list to see if anybody has their hands up from time to time. So if you'd like to pose a question, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, and I've got a series of questions, but I also keep an eye on the chat as we move forward. There was one very specific question, um, Professor Dosa, that I'd love you to comment on. And, it was really about the methodology um, for your work, um, about, I guess, two questions kind of together about the method uh, and the approach. One was about uh, how, many, how many informants or subjects, um, participants um, did you work with in each one of these settings? Just trying, I think, to understand that. And, and a little bit about the ethical challenges. How does one approach doing this work, particularly in global settings? I think that would be helpful. I think these are very important questions. Uh, as an ethnographer, we employ uh, multiple methods, participant observations, uh, formal interviews, uh, conversations, and uh, also um, stories, memories. And um, we also look at the language of the body, the language of silence. So I think through these multiple pedagogies, I was able to acquire some understanding of how uh, the women that I worked with were engaged in social justice work. And um, in terms of numbers, um, well, I would say large, large number of my participants actually come from Metropolis Vancouver, where I have done the most work. Uh, in India and other places, I would say the participants were about 30, about average 30 participants. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of ethical issues, yes, there are always ethical issues when we come, when we kind of engage into close encounter with our participants. It's not a survey and we do not talk to our participants from a distance. So we need to be very respectful we need to be aware of the nuances of culture. Uh, and also um, we need to be cognizant of um, the fact that participants do not always share their stories at one go. So I think that ethics requires time and it requires building a rapport. And in my case, um, I did have some advantage because I am a Muslim anth anthropologist, um, but that's also a disadvantage because sometimes, you know, we tend to take it for granted that they understand us, but then, you know, that's not necessarily the case. There's a diversity of expressions, diversity of practices. And so I would say that essentially the ethical requirement calls on us to take our time, but it also compels us to engage into what I refer to as activist anthropology. It makes us responsible 
to see that we do capture uh, what in my work, what I found was the inner recesses where social justice was present, but was not made socially visible. Thank you. Uh, you know, one theme that came up in the chat as I was um, looking through it, um, Professor Doso, was this idea of, you know, the comparison that you were making between Muslims and Hindus. And I think uh, there, there might have been an interpretation that you were suggesting that Hindu uh, people aren't poor, uh, or that through this comparison, you're you're making certain assumptions about the Hindu community. I don't, I'm not necessarily sure that's where you were going. And I just wanted to give you a chance to, to expand on that, to think about the diversity also within the Hindu community. Right, exactly. Uh, I'm glad you raised this point because uh, the slide that I showed on um, uh, purchasing electric goods, and I did mention they were from affluent Hindu families. But I do recognize that there is diversity um, some of the very poor uh, Hindu families resided in the same area as Muslim families. And then they built uh, ties of uh, uh, friendship. Uh, and in Porbandar, I came across one particular Hindu group and they, they called themselves the Bavari community. And they, they were actually nomads and they lived on the streets as families. But again, I noticed that you know, the interconnectivity and solidarity among this group was very strong. So I am not at all overlooking the fact that there are Hindu families that are poor, that are struggling, that have been shortchanged by the rise of a neoliberal global capitalism. Thank you very much for that clarification. I think that's very helpful. Uh, it's interesting. I also, I just want to, as an aside, uh, I see in the chat a bit of a correction about whether to refer to you as professor or doctor. Uh, I think in the in the uh, in the academy, I think what we use both terms interchangeably. I should ask you uh, just to uh, whether you have a preference. Both are fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I, this is an interesting question um, um, about. Um, uh, um, about social justice, and and it's it's it, it, it's a it's a question about. Let me just get it get it back here. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, uh, it's about uh, a world that's structured around pa uh, patriarchal systems, um, and this is a question from Sangeeta, who asks: In a world that is structured around patriarchal systems, how can traditional strengths that women in each of these settings bring? Um, and how can they be tapped uh, into promoting well-being? So it's about these, these other types of structures. How do we think about that? Yeah, I, I do not want to overlook the, the patriarchal structure and I do not want to overlook the framework of inter intersectionality, which includes race, class, um, gender. But what I discovered um, from, the, uh, from my research participants that um, women have intuitive knowledge on how to work with patriarchy in a manner that gives them some leeway um, to re rebuild their lives, particularly after violence, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, violence and war. Uh, but I do not want to overlook the fact that patriarchal systems have been oppressive towards women. And it is another form of oppression that we need to address. Uh, and I think that would be, uh, you know, require another um, project altogether. Um, but if one were to look at the scholarship of Muslim women, uh, and this is, you know, the area that I'm conversant with, uh, Muslim women are now engaged, particularly those who are scholars, in reinterpreting the um, the patriarchal system in a way that works to their advantage in terms of highlighting how traditions have held them back. Like for example, Saba Mahmoud, uh, Jasmine Zin, um, these are the two uh, Mills. These are the examples, uh, Lila Abu Lugard, uh, also uh, Sarah Ahmed. So these are the scholars who bring to light you know, more nuanced understandings. So my response would be to look at nuances 
rather than taking patriarchal system is you know too abstract or too generalized right so uh, maybe just to uh, uh, pick up on that a little bit um, more um, there's a question here about um, the fact that you focus uh, on agency and is it possible for you to explain more about the structures um, um, that really are affecting uh, let me just get this question right um, um yeah to, to really focus on the uh, other types of structures that really are affecting these agentic practices of these women uh, you know I, I think we've talked a little bit about the patriarchal structures but are there other dynamics that we need to be thinking about um absolutely um i think there are times when women are not able to exercise agency i have an example of goli um she had an apartment which allowed her to um to go out to establish friendships uh, with other Iranian women, she's an Iranian, and um, to shop and to go for a walk and to take the bus. But she was um, you know, in a bind because she could not continue to afford the rent. So she applied to BC housing for another place because she was scared that you know, she would run out of money. And the other place that was shown to her was uh, actually cut off from all these amenities that she was uh, actually used to. And it's not that she was making a case for amenities, but she said, you know, if I move into this place, I will be totally cut off from social life. And what she was saying is her agency came into place because she gave a different meaning to, the, to home. home. What home meant to her was a place that would allow one to live in an enabling environment whereby one can access um, goods and services, also interact with people. And she said that BC housing's definition of home was a physical place. And for her, it was a social place. So she did not actually move into that apartment that would have been less expensive, but she did make the point. It was not exactly her agency, but she made this larger point that you know home is not a physical space and that the larger society has to learn that home is more than just a building and i thought that was a very poignant play, point that she made thank you for that um uh, again i encourage people if you want to put your hand up i'll check uh you can also ask your question uh in person to uh, professor dosa um, but also, um, I am scanning the chat. If I miss something, feel free to repost it if you'd like. Um, it's interesting, there is a question here about um, the dynamics. And again, these are structural dynamics that uh, we keep returning to. Um, and the question is coming from Shiraz Ramji, how do ethnic or religious supremacy um, obstruct dialogue and, and sharing of knowledge and experience and resources amongst both women and men? So. You know, what's, what are your thoughts about, uh, about those dynamics? Oh, I think religious uh, supremacy, if, uh, uh, if the comparison is made between right supremacists, I think there is no room for dialogue and conversation. I think people who want to engage into dialogue and conversation need to be committed to have this dialogue and conversation, not in the context of a boardroom, but at a deeper level whereby the dialogue and conversation continues on an ongoing basis in the context of everyday life. And this is what I tell my students. They ask me, you know, so how do we engage into social justice work? And I said, you can bring about change by actually influencing and in your own sphere in terms of where you work, where you go to school, where you interact, where you have your social uh, connections, but do not take, uh, you know, compassion and uh, empathy, um, you know, as terms that are just kind of circulated, but really draw from your traditions at a very deep level. And by traditions, I mean drawing upon alternative pedagogies that I talked about earlier in terms of uh, poetics, in terms of musicality, and, I have a quotations, but I didn't um, 
uh, I didn't cite them because we are running out of time. Uh, but so I tell my students to not only just kind of think that you are doing compassionate work just because you help an elderly person, you really need to be committed and that committed can only come from your traditions that are engaged into conversation with other traditions. This would be my response. Yeah, that's so powerful. Um, that was such a, an important theme and what you were saying today has been this, this notion of engaging in conversation. Uh, easy to say, hard to do sometimes, right? In terms of really listening to one another and being prepared to be at that place. Yeah. Um, Renee asks um, if you have suggestions on how to move forward. So we've talked about conversation and I'm wondering if you have other suggestions about how will we um, move social justice uh, from oh, the margin. I, uh, can I just um, show my last slide? Which you I sure can, show. absolutely. I think that would be a response to the question that has been asked by Renee. Okay, so. Good for you, Renee, for giving uh, Professor Dosa this opportunity. That's great. So um, I think um, what um, we can, okay, so here. So I want to highlight two components. First is the primordial symbols that are embedded in the sacred. I, that's why I show this image of the vision quest. Uh, and so this would affirm our humanity in the context of living beings. Uh, be aware that we include moral and ethical dimensions. Also recognize the commonality um, that we are all vulnerable and life is fragile and how do we are awakened to human existence. But beyond that, um, my last words would be to actually use um, alternative pedagogies ourselves um, to engage into conversation, not just use the institutional discourse or institutional language that is available to us. So alternative pedagogies are used by people on the margins of society. And that's one thing that we can actually um, adopt because it will bring about transformative change and um, also the metaphor of the journey. But may I just read a very short passage to uh, respond to Rene's uh, question, may I? Uh, Absolutely. This is from my uh, work on palliation, social palliation. And uh, what I have here, is, uh, I just find it. I have a verse from Saidi and probably that kind of substantiates what I'm, uh, what I'm uh, striving to suggest. Uh, he says, a raindrop dripping from a cloud, ashamed when it saw the sea. Who am I? Where is the sea? It said, is it saw itself from eyes of humility? A shell embraced it and made him a pearl. And then there is a verse from Rumi, it says, raise your words, not voice. It is a rain that grows flowers, not thunder. So this is what I mean by tapping into alternative pedagogies that are present in all traditions, not only one tradition. So, and this is how we can engage into having conversations. Thank you very much. Uh... Lots of questions, so let me see if we can get a few more in before we run out of time. And maybe um, if you can stop script sharing your um, The question um, is uh, from Alexandra, who's a third year, uh, uh, third year of education, and she's wondering what's something that she can do um, to promote social justice for, these marginal for those marginalized uh, in future classrooms talked about conversation, obviously that's part of it. Would you have other recommendations? Well, um, I guess in my class, I use the example of the planet Earth and I say, well, it's a small planet uh, among galaxies. So make the students aware that there are other universes and that the question that arises for consideration is how come that we cannot get along together in this small planet? And how come that we are so cruel and unkind to others? But what I would do in my classroom is make students just write um, about 
their traditions. I do, I, you know, I'm, I'm convinced, uh, you know, from my research that traditions help us to establish uh, connections, engage into conversations, and make us obliged um, to take action. So I would encourage students to write um, best, uh, a story um, that um, is from the lived reality that they might, uh, you know, uh, have an understanding of, or they might have access to, and then see how they can draw upon positive aspects of their traditions. And the third issue would be how these traditions, rather than remaining within the discrete space, within a narrow space, in fact, can open up uh, so that there can be a conversation. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, there's, a, there's a question as well um, about uh, the principles that might underlie a vision for um, social justice. Are, are there particular principles um, underlying your vision um, um, that you've articulated today um, that, that you can share with us? Um, yeah, there are uh, principles that, um, um, just thinking, um, if I could just cite from my work, I think it's easier um, to highlight the principles because I don't want to repeat uh, what I have already said. Uh, but I think the principles that I am able to find most useful is to draw upon uh, my researchers take on social justice and build on those. So there are two women here and I just read this passage if it's okay. Both women are animated pers persons wishing to share everyday enactments embedded in social and bodily know-how. These practices are analogous to affect, imagination, and intuition rather than mere rationalization. It is in this way, way that both women reveal the vitality of human experiences that shape the multiple and contradictory positions that marginalized subjects occupy. In their own ways, women question existing ways of apprehending the world. In the process, they reveal the contours of um, social palliation or, or social justice, which translates into small acts of caring. So I would say my starting point would be small acts of caring rather than grand projects, because grand projects can be complemented with everyday life situations where we are positioned to act. Thank you for that, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I'm wondering uh, as we close, uh, if you have any, you know, if, if people wanted to push their thinking a little bit more, um, if you'd have any recommendations for things that we should read or um, to, to, to push us uh, forward to think more about uh, social justice and particularly uh, social justice from the margins, what would you recommend? Well, there are lots of books. Uh, I was thinking if I can send an email out um, to you or Seth and uh, just uh, list a couple of books on social justice. I think it would not be fair to just cite one or two authors, but there's one particular author that comes to mind and this Lila Abu Lugar and uh, her book is entitled do Muslim women need to be saved? And she makes a case for how our priorities have been misplaced because we try to save other people rather than recognize that they have already choked the pathways for change. But then we, we have not actually captured those pathways, pathways that will bridge um, you know, deep-seated divides in our society and in the world. So I, I, can, I can send a list of books that we can read, but I don't want to just give names of one or two books. If well, thank okay. you for that. Yeah, thank you for that recommendation. It's, it's, um, 
It's interesting. I mean, even some of the citation that you provided, uh, this, uh, this has been an area of study for, for many, for, for centuries. Uh, and there is a lot to delve into, that's for sure. Um, so listen, I, I am conscious that our time is drawing um, uh, to an end. Um, I have enjoyed this conversation. I've enjoyed your presentation so very much. Um, and I want to thank all the participants for the amazing questions as well. Um, uh, obviously, a very engaged audience, Professor Dosa, and uh, thinking, thinking a lot about um, the opportunities um, um, uh, for us to advance social justice together. Um, I really want to also thank all of the organizers for this evening, um, Public Square for their outstanding event organization. I want to thank our excellent captioners from AI Media um, uh, for, for really helping to make um, this event accessible. Um, it's, it's really uh, wonderful to see this, uh, the scholarship um, from SFU faculty. Uh, and I'm really was very pleased to be part of the of this event this evening. For those of you um, um, who want to join us for the next President's Faculty Lecture, it's going to take place on Tuesday, March the 9th at 6 p.m. And it features um, Lalik Tin um, Brumelhas. He's an associate professor, School of Business, and presenting on the topic of work hard, play hard, the role of recovery after work. Uh, certainly something I'll be very interested in learning more about. You can find more about this and about other upcoming events on the SFU Public um, Square website at sfu.ca slash public square. So um, I understand we have a very short video uh, promo to close out the event. I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening and um, for being so engaged uh, in the discussion. So without further ado, we'll watch the video to take us out. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.